my name's Connor Woodman. I used to be a market analyst in the City of London, working on deals worth hundreds of millions of pounds. But I'd had enough of e-business done on a computer screen, so I quit. I'm really happy. Really I want to get out and test myself in real markets, haggling face to face with hardened traders. 12,000, oh, it's a bit too low, too low. 32,200? So forget the economic doom and gloom. I think I can make money and have a great time trading my way around the world. It's the way people used to do business buying something and travelling with it and selling it in another place. This is exactly what it's all about. I've taken 25 grand from the sale of my flat to invest in all kinds of products. Animal. There's thousands of camels here. There's camels over there, over there, over there. Everywhere you look, there's camels. Mineral. <laughs> yeah. What have I done? And vegetable. Looks like you've cleaned up for breakfast. Oh. <laughs> 75 oh. Woohoo! <laughs> this has got so bad. Oh. It's just doing my head in. It's a journey that'll take me across four continents and 16 countries. With any luck, I'll make some serious money. If it goes wrong, I'll lose the lot. I started my journey in Africa, where I had a baptism of fire in the camel markets of Sudan. Drive me absolutely up the wall. I got totally shut out by local traders. But I pioneered a new trade in coffee from Zambia to South Africa. Fine, deal. And made my first profit. Woo, thank God for that. Thank absolute God for that. This time I'm trading my way from west to east across Asia. I try my hand at horse trading in the mountains of Kyrgyzstan. Real cowboys. In the deserts of western China, I invest in a high-risk, high-return precious stone, white jade. Needles and haystacks spring to mind, don't they? And in Shanghai, I blaze a trail for South African wine. I, I don't like this wine. I don't think they have the culture to make wine. Right now, I'm starting in Delhi. I've taken a gamble on being able to sell 4,000 bottles of chilli sauce to the Indians. Seeing them all in one place kind of brings it home to me what a risk I've taken here. <laughs> it's our England, England football shirt. Made in the Punjab, sold in Delhi. Foreign products, real or otherwise, are all the rage here. I'm targeting Delhi's more upmarket streets where the shops sell expensive imported foods. India's economic boom means that there are lots of well off people happy to pay top dollar for premium brands like Bushman's chili sauce. This is a brand, but it's an extra hot peri peri sauce, which is what I'm selling. And look at the price. It's $7. I only paid $1.80, 90p for mine. This is what he calls hot as hell. All right, you like that's that. a very enterprising name. <laughs> Perfect, OK. You like hot as hell. OK. <laughs> Definitely hot. Definitely hot as hell. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> OK. You like Spicy. it? You like it? Spicy, sir? <laughs> I'll take 18 balls of each. We have a deal. Good now. We just paid 50% over what it cost me to get the sources here. Wait, wait. Yeah. This is for my taste. This is for your taste. My nice. Indian taste. You want to check on it? Uh -huh. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Is this a product that you'd be interested in stocking? Sure. I will. <laughs> 252 bottles sold, 3,548 still to go. There's no doubt my sources will sell really well, but I hadn't realised India is a nation of small shopkeepers. 
I need a wholesaler like Puneet Gupta to buy the lot, or I'm in trouble. Hot as hell. I want you to taste it. Should we get water first? No, no, water won't help you. <laughs> Tactic number one, soften him up with some hot as hell sauce. <coughs> Pretty hot. You can really taste the chilies in this one. <clears throat> but how, how come you are able to eat chilies? How come I'm able to eat chilies? I've been practicing. <laughs> so, anyway, I think we can uh, take a couple of days to decide on exactly what we want to do. We need to make a decision probably end, by the end of tomorrow, really. No sooner do I return to my hotel, the phone rings. We can, we can, yes. It's Puneet Gupta. Okay, but I, I could, I could work with that. I'll work, I'll work with you. Okay, I'll work with you. Don't you, don't you worry, Puneet. We'll come to an agreement. Hmm. Interesting. He said, "Can I buy half the stock?" I said, "No, it's all for sale." He said, "Okay, could I pay?" for half of it now up front and the other half in a month's time? Yes. OK, we'll talk tomorrow. Good news. Very good news. <laughs> Delhi's taught me a valuable lesson. If I'm going to sell products in large quantities, I'll have to go straight to the big buyers, like Panit. Here he is. Hi. They're queuing, they're queuing up for it. <laughs> How are you? Hey. Sorry, I've, I've adulterated your warehouse. I've converted it into a Bushman's, Bushman's Chili warehouse. I brought the sauces into Delhi for 90p a bottle. That's 72 rupees. Yeah, but what's your price to me? Uh, I would say that you give it to me around 88 or 90. Split the difference, 89. Yeah. 89, yes. 89 a bottle. Yeah. And you pay me half now and you give me a post date check for 45 yes, yes. days. Thank Let's you. Let's do it. Yeah. Yes. 89 rupees is £1.10, but I only paid 90p a bottle to bring them to Delhi. That means when I tot up the figures, I've made a profit of £780, which brings my total profit up to more than £1,650. You are a good businessman. <laughs> Your selection of the product is very good. Thank, Thank you. you very much. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you for I'm heading to China to meet my wine in three weeks so I have time to take the long route. I've discovered a business opportunity in a forgotten corner of Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan, a former Soviet republic. Kyrgyzstan is on the ancient Silk Road to China, where Marco Polo traded in the 13th century. Horses are still the main means of transport round here, so they're very valuable. If I can buy them in the mountains where they roam semi-wild, I should be able to sell them for a good profit at a lowland market. I'm actually secretly living out a cowboy fantasy at the moment, riding up into the hills to go and rustle some horses. Another lifetime ambition ticked off the list. <laughs> I've failed miserably with livestock before as a camel trader, but I'm determined to try again, this time as a horse trader. I'm 10,000 feet above sea level in the former Soviet Republic of Kyrgyzstan, and I'm trying to make it as a horse trader. I've hooked up with a Kyrgyz breeder called Munabek, who has some cheap horses for sale in the mountains. I've come to this remote hillside because the further I am from the market, the lower the prices. As I did with coffee, I can make my profit by cutting out the middleman and doing it all myself. Well, that beats a trip to work on the tube in the morning. It's probably a bit faster as well. Well done, Speedy. Thank you. Good job. This is farming Kyrgyz style, and Munobek's horses run wild up here. This is... Yeah, coming as close to the source as I reckon you can get. So hopefully there may be a bit of profit out of cutting that middleman out of the trade. 
I'm budgeting about £2,000 on buying four horses here. A good horse dealer should get an extra 30% on the value of any horse at market. This trade's going to be all about my skills as a negotiator and my eye for a good horse. It's this, this red one here in the middle. Yeah, yeah. And this one, you see? And that? It's a grey one. Oh, the grey one. The grey one doesn't look very good. This one? Not too skinny? He's not too fat, not too skinny. But first, he's got cash. It's fine. I've decided to spread my risk by going for two big horses for riding. It doesn't want to be caught. And two small horses for agricultural work. It's a feisty little bugger. This little one is proving to be big trouble. Maybe he likes freedom. I think he likes staying with you here in the mountains. He doesn't want to go. I'm going to yeah. call this one Steve. Steve? Yeah. Because Steve was a good sportsman who is running in you remember Steve? UK? You remember Steve McQueen? No. The Great Escape? No, no. Yeah, this one. Uh. He escapes all the time. <laughs> call him <laughs> okay. Steve. As well as Steve, I've chosen two big horses that I've called Martin and Liam Gallagher, plus a pony called Charlie. I bought four horses, so now I've just got to ride them down the mountain, transport them across the country mm. and sell them at the market. You're a crazy guy. <laughs> <laughs> I think I agree. <laughs> I think I agree. Horse trading's a big gamble. They don't come with price tags. Making money depends on picking the right market and how you perform when you get there. Oh, it's a big risk for the corner because to buy it's easy, but it's uh, very difficult to sell because he doesn't know our culture, he doesn't know very well our people and... Um, Connor doing a crazy thing. Well, yeah, the boys are saddling up. It's time to go. For now, we're heading to a town called Toktagol, where I hope to get some last-minute advice on which market I should sell my horses at. This is a farmstead that belongs to the oldest horse dealer in town, 83-year-old Chamchiata. What he doesn't know about horses isn't worth knowing. Another hard day at the office. The only time he wasn't dealing in horses was when he was fighting the Germans in the Second World War. What happened to your fingers? On the Second, on the second War, it was a battle and... Uh... It was a uh, bullet uh, was de uh, has destroyed his fingers. Ooh. So since that time, he's uh, like this. What advice could you give me if I'm thinking about becoming a horse trader? One of the big markets is in Uzgen. Uzgen. Uzgen, in Uzgen city. So there, there you can have uh, good possibilities to sell your horses for good price. But there's a sting in the tail. Uzgen Market is eight hours' drive away and only open once a week. I'll get one chance to make my profit. It's a high-risk strategy. From what I've heard, this is going to be a very, very tough trade. Um, I'm going to need a lot of negotiation to go my way, and I think I'm going to need a fair slice of luck as well. It's a beautiful horse. I am the proverbial saddle sore. All down my legs, my back, my tummy, oh, my hands, everything aches. But, God, it was worth it. I have to get up at five to start loading the horses because I've only got one day to take them 200 miles through the mountains. Well, obviously, we're not going to ride the horses all the way through us again, so uh, we need a truck. And that looks like a Soviet relic. <coughs> Steve McQueen, escapee number one. 
I feel quite glad actually that I'm only transporting four horses in this truck. Apparently the norm is to transport 15. Why do I have a sneaky suspicion that Martin is not going to want to go in that truck? Well, would you want to go in that truck? This will be one hell of a trip. One day to go from top to gold, south through the mountains and to the horse market at Uzgen, which is on the border with Uzbekistan. We have encountered the goats. Horsepower versus goat power. We've been here before. <laughs> the vehicles just keep getting bigger. Amazingly, we just push started a 10 ton truck with four horses in it. I'm relieved to reach Uzgen by early evening. There they are, all safe and sound. And by the looks of things, some people are pleased to see us. This guy's already checking them out. Straight away. Huh? Ready to start a trade? They want to buy. They want to buy straight away? Yeah. This is Slava, my local translator. How much is for this one? For this horse? 70,000. 26. I paid more than £600 for him, and he's offering less than half. Let's go, 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 These guys are just waiting here, speculating the day before the market, seeing what they can pick up the day before. I'm not falling for this lot. I hope to get some proper offers for my horses when the market opens tomorrow. OK, guys, look, we'll see you at the market later, I think. I said, what do I know about horses? Well, I know what I paid for them. I want to make sure my horses are safe overnight, and my only option is to sleep in the field with them. I am utterly knackered. I thought I was knackered yesterday, but after driving halfway across Kyrgyzstan to come here to market and then being battered by all those traders today. I'm sleeping by the side of the road in a field with a farting horse. I've got to say, it's getting about as tough as it can get. But tomorrow at dawn, I will find out whether I can hack it as a horse trader. The road to market is lined with more speculators trying to distract me from my path. Feels a bit like going to battle after yesterday's experience. In the market. This is the gladiatorial arena. Etiquette dictates that deals are done with a vigorous handshake. To break your grip mid-negotiation means an embarrassing loss of face. There's no going rate for a horse. This is all about brinksmanship, and it's all very intimidating. It's my first and only day in the Uzgen livestock market. So it's a baptism of fire. <laughs> This is what I paid Munabek for each of my horses. Charlie's the first one I'm going to try to sell. He was £375. In local currency, that's 30,000 som, 
although locals usually abbreviate 30,000 to just 30. And I hope to get a lot more than that. Give your hand. Give your hand. 14. No, no, no. 33. 33? 33. You have to leave us. Give me 32. 32. Give me 32. Give me 32. Give me 32. Give me 32. I came from England. I didn't fall out of the sky. Give me 32. Give me Manabek said, hold your nerve. Said a lot of time wasters will come along early on. So, I'm feeling the pressure a bit. Another of my horses comes under scrutiny. This is Liam. I paid £610 for him. That's 45,000 som. His final price is 30,000 No, 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 I crumble. Give me 35. Give me 35. 35. Let's go. 34. 31 is fine. Come on, come down a bit. 32. 32. 32. 500. 32. 32. 32. and uh, that's all. Or if he walks away. No, he won't walk away. He's going to walk away after all this. 32,500 and he's got a great horse. He can afford it. He can afford it. 32,200. 32,200? Yes. Go on then. Yeah. He may well laugh. He's paying me £400 for a horse I paid 610 for. It's, it's quite overwhelming. You get to a point where you actually have to do a deal because um, of sheer peer pressure. No. Anyway, I learnt from the first one. I learnt from the first one. I'm not going to lose on the next horse. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not even talking to this guy. Ah. <laughs> but the same dealer appears. He senses I'm here for the taking and he's not going to let me go. This time he's after Charlie. He's the one I paid £375 for. 30,000 som. No. He's, getting good, he's had a good deal already for me. He said that he wants it for 21 and he said, OK, 22, take it for 22. I feel pressured into asking for less than I paid for him. Again. 23, and when he comes, when he comes to England, I'll buy a horse from him. Thank you. Well I'm stunned. That's another £125 lost. I think I'm now a soft touch. And this guy is breaking my heart. <laughs> These are the worst deals I've ever done. I get the impression they're all having a laugh at my expense. Now they're asking to test ride my biggest horse, Martin. He wants to ride. He wants to check with him. Seriously? This is turning into a nightmare. Slava told me afterwards that this is perfectly normal behaviour. This man plays a sort of Kyrgyz polo, except they use a dead goat instead of a ball. I mean, I guess that's the way that they do things around here. Yeah. And just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, that chancer I met at the start is back. The market's drawing to a close. A lot of the serious buyers are leaving. And what's left are the speculators that were here at the start.
I'm not dealing with this man anymore. This is a time waster. 23, if you like, 23. If you like the price, that's fine. Otherwise, no point. <laughs> this has gone so badly. <laughs> oh. I decide to leave the market with two unsold horses, a massive dent in my bank account, and my pride. I'm trying to beat the economic meltdown, travelling the world, buying and selling products, and I'm risking £25,000 of my own money to do it. But my horse trade in Kyrgyzstan has been a disaster. Never mind making money, at this rate, I risk losing the lot. I've decided to cut my losses. A local farmer's agreed to give them a home. I've still made a loss, but nothing compared with what I was facing at the market. Martin's life continues now with this gentleman. And mine continues somewhere else. <laughs> Is this my money? Thank you. Spazibar. £764 sterling. <laughs> Good luck. It's only when I tot up the figures that I see how much I lost on each horse. Including £250 for the hire of the lorry, that's a whopping £640 lost. It means my total profits have fallen to just over £1,000. Broken by the failure of the horse trade, I cross the Chenshan Mountains and into the deserts of western China. I'm heading to a boom town called Hotan, where I hope to salvage my pride and get my trading back on track. Well, this sort of desert isn't exactly what I expected when I came to western China, but to get to Hotan, you've got to go straight through it. Hotan is famous for a product that could be the perfect antidote to horses. It's easier to transport and the market is always open. It's the rare gemstone, white jade. How much is one of those little pebbles? 15,000 yuan. So 1,000 pounds? Yes, 1,000 pounds, yes. 1,000 pounds just yeah. for that little yeah. pebble? Yeah, because Chinese people like jade. So how much for the, the piece that he's lighting up? 2,000 Mm. Can I see? 3,000 euro. 3,000 euro, yeah. 30,000 Chinese yuan. If I'm going to make a profit, I'll need to get it cheap. And that means going straight to the source. Nearby is the Karakash River, which dries up for eight months a year. But when the water's gone, the prospectors dig in. Well, needles and haystacks spring to mind, don't they? Bloody hell. Fast. On the bank, the prospectors try to sell what they've found. <laughs> I've no idea which stones are worth what, but this buyer seems to know what he's doing. Well, what do you buy? 1,000? Chen. 1,000. A bargain for 50 quid. It turns out Mr Chen makes his living buying and selling jade. Are these men working together as a, as a collective? Chen buys his jade here straight from the miners, and for a small fee, he'll help me find a genuine piece. You wait one day for the for the big find, the big piece of good stuff. <laughs> it's disappointing there are no bargains on offer here, but the thought of a J trade is starting to excite me. 
It's a massive gamble, but I've decided to invest £3,000 in jade. Mr Chen says if I can get a raw piece and have it carved, its value can triple if I sell it in the Far East. You can tell Mr Chan is totally comfortable in this environment. He's done this a hundred times before, he knows exactly what he's looking for. His expertise is absolutely invaluable to me. A lot of the jade here is fake and I have no idea how to spot the real stuff. I have to place complete trust in Mr Chen's expertise because this place feels like the Wild West. A delivery is made to a nearby shop, which Mr Chen intercepts. We think it's a good one. It's the best stone I've seen today. This guy's looking for £4,000 for the stone, but I've told Mr Chen to offer him two. That's around 30,000 Chinese renminbi. Well, I'd like it for 30,000, but you're saying that's too low, so... What do you think? That's about 2,250 quid for three kilos of jade. <laughs> what have I done? I have a sniff of a good profit, so long as I find someone good to carve it. I'm on the move again, a two-day train journey across China to Shanghai, where I hope to find a master carver to cut my jade. First stop, Suzhou, just outside Shanghai. It's famous for being home to China's best jade cutters. And they don't come cheap. They charge up to £10,000 to carve raw jade. This sort of image is something I've seen in Japanese art, I've seen it in Chinese art. Solitary figure, mountain scene. It's not religious, it's not closing any doors, it's keeping my options open. Upstairs is the workshop and the master cutter. Under the watchful gaze of his wife, he makes his pitch. He's just asked the equivalent of £8,000. Way, way, way too high. It's just no, nowhere near, nowhere near. It's a shame because I like your, um, I like your mountains. I think they're very good. It's not just the price that shocked me. It's the cutter's wife insinuating that my jade's no good. <laughs> so I could, there's no way I can afford to pay seven thousand pounds having it cut, and it, you know, it cost two and a half thousand pounds to buy. It's just too much going into what's essentially still quite an unknown market. So this is even more top end than the last place we were at. Yeah. Yeah, you know what they're going to say, yeah. don't you? Yeah. This is the master cutter. And this is the sort of thing he makes. That's exactly what I'm, what I'm looking for. He said, OK, no problem. It took him a long time to say, OK, no problem, didn't it? 
，把它价值升到最高位。你觉得你要需要花多少钱能够把它升，让它这个东西升值到最高位？就是是也不要有多大利润的情况下，这东西我们工程也要投到三万块钱。<laughs> He's agreed to cut my jade for a quarter of what the last place offered. That was an absolutely brilliant deal, I thought. He wants £2,000. That's a brilliant deal. And the work was fantastic. Brilliant, brilliant work. Well done, you. <laughs> the jade will be cut and ready for collection in five weeks. A further 50 miles east is Shanghai. Home to 20 million people and one of the fastest growing economies in the world. I'm here because six weeks ago, when I was in South Africa, I fell in love with a vineyard called Mount Rosier. Absolutely stunning. It's pretty special, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> now you understand why I love this place. I struck an incredible deal with the owner, buying 1,500 bottles of his Rosier Bay wine. I don't think this is going to be a hard sell at all for you. I, I really don't. You're not the one going to Shanghai. <laughs> I also bought 1,500 bottles of a cheaper wine called Arniston Bay from a large wholesaler. I'm not used to drinking at this time of the morning. <laughs> French wine currently dominates the Chinese market. Here we go. 3,000 bottles of wine. But I think they're ready for something new and different. I've been here with the chilli sauce and at first glance this looks like a very daunting amount of wine to sell but Shanghai is a big place and Shanghai has an awful lot of people and it's sophisticated people. People live in Shanghai to, because they want access to these great Western products like these things. So if I'm going to sell these anywhere in China this has got to be the right place. I meet a French wine importer who's already cracked the Shanghai market. Lionel Legal tells me that wine commands a cracking 60% markup at wholesale. That would make me almost £5,000 profit. What do you think my chances are of selling 3,000 bottles of wine in Shanghai in four days? What, one shot deal? 30%. 40%. 30. 30%. 30%. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, sporting, sporting odds. Uh, the, the point is you don't, you don't sell French wine. That's, that's, a, that's a weak point. Yeah. For the Chinese market. Yeah, they do like the French wines. Yeah. yeah. I could have got this horribly wrong. Perhaps the Chinese aren't ready for South African wine yet. Lionel's comment that I've got about a 30% chance of selling this wine in what he calls a, a one-shot deal leaves me feeling a little bit jangly, actually. I'm, uh, my nerves are kind of... <laughs> I'm fairly frayed. But I think I've learned enough from this trip to come up with a plan. What I learned from the Delhi experience is that the key people are the distributors, so what I've organised tonight is an event that I've invited lots of distributors to. It's a bit of a one-chance sales pitch to all the distributors in town. I've invited as many distributors as I can to a party to sell not just wine, but Hello. South African wine. Nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Is your right. first visit here? First time in China, yeah. Ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what do the punters think? Sorry, no common. What did you... Um, think of this Rosier Bay wine. I'm very interested to hear your opinion. Very nice. Um, for me, it's very full-bodied wine. I, I don't like this wine, of course, because it's from um, South Africa. I don't think they have the culture to make wine. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't please everyone. Thank you. I've worked my way round the whole room to find out who are the serious buyers and who's just come for a free glass of wine. Yeah. You, you like that one, don't you? But the first one is 85. 85. Yeah. You're going to talk to your boss, you're going to sample the two wines, and then we're going to talk on the phone. We're in the market for some South African wines tonight? Yeah, we always like to try them. We have uh, some bars and restaurants in uh, Shanghai, and we go through a lot of wine. 
perhaps this isn't going to be as difficult as I thought. What sort of restaurants do you, do you have? Uh, we have a place called Malone's, which is a uh, sports bar. And we go through a lot of wine. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks. I've met some potential buyers tonight, but he is by far the most promising. Poodle with trainers. Welcome to Shanghai. <laughs> One of his restaurants is just a few blocks away, and he says he's phoned ahead to arrange a meeting for me with the bar manager. Hello. Hi, Sean. Yeah. Hi, Connor. Hey, Connor. How are you? Good to meet nice you. See. Good. Um, well. It was uh, John that actually put me on to you because he That's came right, to a little presentation I did last night. I don't know how much he's told you about it. Absolutely nothing. Nothing? No. Oh, right, OK. I'm the unexpected guest. Can I talk to Ben, please? With an uneasy feeling. Thank you. This is a beer house, yeah. really. Um, I mean, we do sell wines on occasion, but the majority of the beverage that we sell is beer. Being a sports bar, it's not a lot of guys, you know, scream at the TV and then sipping on their wine. They're more slamming beers and yeah. tequila shots. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks Cheers, mate. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thanks. you too. I'll have a beer if you don't mind. Let's do it. Lucky wine. Well, what a complete bloody waste of time that was, trying to sell wine in a beer shop. Ugh, what a rubbish lead to follow. That's my own fault for not doing proper research. I hope to God the other contacts actually sell wine. I'm in Shanghai trying to sell 3,000 bottles of South African wine. And after visiting my first lead, I'm worried that I'll never shift it. Yeah, people like you, like some serious buyers to be there. Another person who showed interest at the party was Mike Lee, a buyer for a small distributor. I like it. It's, uh, it's not simple. It's not too complex. How much is it? 85. All taxes paid. Ready. Yeah. Ready to go. Good That's price a, for that it, wine? It's a very good price. Yeah. It's a very good price. I'm not tempting you. Eh? Hey? I'm not tempting you. Tempting me? Yeah. <laughs> I enjoy the wines, but South African wines is a very, very, very small mm. part of the industry. Yeah. That's a no, then. I'm actually really surprised that someone hasn't seen this op as an opportunity and I'm quite shocked that the place is seemingly so a lot more slow moving than it, it might appear at first sight. Surely David Andrews will take it. He runs China's biggest distributor with a portfolio of over 800 wines. That's really good. You can take this? Will you? At the moment, it's a very difficult thing for us. Uh, we're very lucky to work with a group called Distel, and we've got great exclusivity contracts with them. They've been supporting us for many, many years. Right, legal Look teams. Look it. it's going to be a little bit tough. And I think a lot of distributors you might have the same challenge with. I'm nearly 6,000 miles from home with 3,000 bottles of wine that I can't sell. None of the contacts from my party have come to anything. It's been enormously frustrating trying to do a deal for the last day and a half, and how frustrating it's been to reach all those dead ends. It just sort of shows the other side of the coin, really, and um, it's, it's quite disheartening and, and al almost depressing. And everybody says to me, it's a great product, it's a great price, but, and it's the but, and it's the but, and it's the but, and the but is just, it's just doing my head in because it's always the deal breaker. It's time for desperate measures. Am I calling you too early? I'm just checking that you got the, uh, the information that I sent through. I'm interested to know whether, you know, the, you would be in the market for um, either of the two South African wines that I brought. The, um, the Rosier Bay, I'm selling at 85 renminbi. You're in Singapore. Oh. 
I'm really looking for someone who can make that decision. To, to come in and, and, and talk to you about the wine, they're bloody good value at that price. Well, if you want me to come in this afternoon, give me a call on the phone. Hello? My last roll of the dice. The Shanghai market is so sewn up by European dealers that amazingly this is the first Chinese owned company I've found. Step in my office, yeah. but it's a bit small. Okay. That's fine, it's fine. I've contacted nearly every distributor in Shanghai. My list of possibles is now painfully short. What is the pricing of this 45 that we discussed, right? 50. We discussed. 50. Not 45? 50 we discussed. <laughs> and then this one is 85. You cannot drop anymore. Uh, well, you're interested in this one too. I mean, I can take both, both labels. It's no problem. You take it all? No point in my portfolio. I only put one label. Then we've, we've got a deal. Yeah, we've got a deal. No problem. <laughs> okay. Okay. See you later. I can't believe what I've just pulled off. I got the full asking price for both wines. It's a better deal than I ever thought possible. What brilliant result. The quality of the wines is very good. I've got no doubt to sell to sell in, in, in Shanghai market or in China the whole China China market, you know it's it's good. You can't, you can't put in the legwork on these trades and it's funny that the, virtually the last place that I tried is the place that took the wine. It's a lesson in keep, keep going, keep going. I was told to aim for a 60% markup. In fact, I've managed an incredible 88%. That means I've made almost £7,000 profit. This means at the end of the Asian leg, I have an overall profit of almost £8,000. I have 4,500 invested in Jade and plenty more in the bank for my next adventure. Next time, I go back to the Master Cutter to pick up my carved Jade. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I try to make a killing on some more high risk, high return deals. It's about £750 yeah. for, for that amount of tea. Yeah. Unbelievable. And I trade my way through Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Japan. Yeah.